Hello everybody. Uh, after discussing with the melt processes and this is one kind of the material processing through melting of the substrate material. Today I am supposed to discuss or I am going to discuss about the solid processes that means material processing directly uh, process from the solid to the uh, end product. So definitely when you try to look into the solid processes it is basically accounts the bulk deformation of the component. So, through deformation. So, definitely when you uh, deform, try to deform the uh, component to bring a particular shape, it must be associated with some amount of the, the heat energy generation. But that heat energy is not sufficient to the melting of the, the substrate material. So, this way it is a different from the melting processes to the bulk deformation process. So, uh, in this uh, module, we will try to cover up the several topics. One is that first we try to understand the mechanical responses, what we can represent the mechanical responses for the metallic material, for the metals or and thermoplastic component also. So, both we will try to discuss in this particular uh, topic. Then we will try to understand the deformation in terms of the hot, hot working and the cold working or other way I can say that hot deformation and the cold deformation processes. Then we will try to discuss about the sequential deformation process and then very specific to hot rolling of the steel component. So, basically that how the component or uh, steel uh, different steel sheet can be manufactured through the rolling operations so that we will try to discuss. Then different uh, forming processes or I can say the bulk deformation process like extrusion, forging and the drawing operation will um, discuss about the technical uh, uh, contents of, of this uh, associated with this different manufacturing processes or material processing technologies. Then we will discuss what about the how to do the perform the bending process, what is the thermoforming and the super plastic forming of the sheet we will try to discuss next and finally several case studies will discuss related to one particular or process or overall we can say the bulk deformation process. So, these are the, the overview of this particular uh, module uh, in the, uh, as uh, module 5 which is associated with the bulk deformation of the material and of course, the maximum temperature is below the melting point temperature of the uh, component. Now, before that first we will try to discuss the mechanical behavior of the metals. So, we know that when one component is subject to some kind of the uniaxial loading conditions, we can characterize this uniaxial loading with the different parameters. For example, we, we can calculate what is the stress, what is the engineering stress associated with this, what is the strain and what we can measure the toughness and what is the fracture point, what is the maximum amount of the stress is be able to sustain by this particular deformation of the uh, component. So, all these uh, typical elements simply describe by our standardized test which is uniaxial tensile testing we can find out all these parameters and these parameters are actually responsible to explain different nature of the deformation bulk deformation processes. For example, we do the most uh, known the tensile testing which is fundamental stress which decide the different kind of the mechanical properties associated with the metal or, or other we can say that what a what can be the response of a material when it is subjected to some kind of the mechanical loading on this component. So, first we quantify this component for example, engineering stress, engineering stress is defined by the load applied with respect to the original cross section area. So, initial cross section area this ratio is basically indicate the stress and this is known as the engineering stress. Similarly, engineering strain can also be defined. So, what is the change of length with respect to the initial length of the component. So, change of length means what is the final length after deformation and what was the initial length the difference between these two divided by the original length initial length L0 that actually indicates the engineering uh, strain. Similarly, we can represent the true stress and true strain also during the deformation. True stress is the, the applied load divided by the cross section area, instantaneous value of the cross section area. Actually, when, when you try to deform, uniformly deform one component, this cross section area hardly remains the constant, it is actually gradually varies during the state of the deformation. So, if we take the any instantaneous value, a ratio of this thing we can define it is the true stress, comp true stress value. 
associated with the this particular deformation process. Similarly, we can define the true strain value also. True strain value can be uh, represented like that uh, logarithm L by L0 uh, this ratio or we can say the logarithm of A0 by A. So, A is the this at the values of the uh, or instantaneous value of the cross section area and A0 is the initial values of the uh, cross section area. Now, we can find out the relation also if we find out the true strain is uh, true stress is basically engineering stress into 1 plus engineering strain. This we can relate between the true stress and uh, true stress and engineering stress. Similarly, true strain and engineering strain can also be related like that logarithm of 1 plus uh, engineering strain. This is the expression for the uh, true strain. I am not going into much details of the how we can evaluate this value because this is a very standard practice. We can find out, we can take any reference of what way this can be derived. The derivation I am just eliminating, uh, not discussing about the derivation of these things. But this is the way we can look into this thing. Now, if we represent the deformation behavior in terms of the stress and strain, so we can say like that gradually we see uh, there is a initial slope is there. So, within this there is a elastic uh, up to this part there is a uh, elastic deformation that means stress is proportional to the strain up to certain limit that is uh, called the, the proportional limit or I can say this is transition point where yielding starts. Yielding means just permanent deformation starts for with the former for the deforming the component. So, from here so I can say this is the elastic domain and the remaining is the plastic domain. Uh, plastic deformation or permanent deformation usually occurs. So, we represent the this stress as a strain. Now, at any point we can say there is a increment of the stress it means that this is the increment of the stress further at this particular strain point the stress value is more than that of the yield stress value. I can say this is the yield stress value. So, uh, it is because there is a strain hardening effect associated with the uh, material. So, because of the strain hardening effect we can say that there is increment of the stress and strain, but when up to certain point it is the optimum value and then gradually it can decrease also. So, when it is decreasing then we can say the strain softening because with further straining the stress value also reduces. So, of course, this explanation also there why it is increasing, why it is decreasing and how it is this is the optimum point. So, that will in subsequent point we will try to discuss uh, all this phenomena, but if you hear the understanding is to how stress versus strain can be plotted uh, in, in, a, in a deformation uh, during deformation of a uh, metallic component. So, here see this is the optimum point and of, I can say this is a failure point after this it fails. So, this actually if you see this is increasing order, but actually it is related by the true stress versus true strain, but if we plot it or uh, engineering stress versus engineering strain it typically behavior is something like that it is the some optimum value and then gradually decreasing and at this point there is a fracture. So, here is the difference between the true stress strain diagram and engineering stress strain diagram. Now, E so Young's modulus with its stress is proportional to the strain. So, this slope is basically representation of the Young's modulus uh, during the initial state of the deformation of the of, of this component. So, from the we can directly calculate the Young's modulus from this stress strain diagram. Now, see this is the yield point in the optimum uh, ultimate tensile strength here and this is the fracture point we can define. So, corresponding stress and strain can be uh, defined. So, here you see that most of the materials is actually having the in general we can say most of the engineering material mat uh, engineering metals is uh, having the behavior like uh, elastoplastic behavior. So, both elastic deformation is also there as well as the plastic component also they are associated with that. So, I can say that engineering materials specifically the elastic part is very low it can be around 10 percent even less than 10 percent remaining 90 percent is basically associated with the uh, plastic deformation with the application of the load uh, for a component. Now, further look into the different aspects of the mechanical behavior of the material we can see. We see that plasticity or formability because plasticity is very much related to the formability that means that that how is we can deform the material and uh, uh, during the material processing. So, that is why we try to discuss the different mechanical behavior of the material to understand the formability of the particular component. So, here you see that plasticity or formability can be express the plastic modulus also which can be uh, the slope of the stress strain curve. So, d sigma by d epsilon p. So, basically if you see there is a when you try to draw the two stress strain diagram. So, at this point what is the slope? The slope represents the 
this uh, this uh, plastic modulus H. So, like Young's modulus is there E, Young's modulus. Similarly, we can define the plastic modulus, but of course, this plastic modulus is actually changes during the state of the deformation because there is a if we observe that during the plastic deformation the stress strain diagram is basically non-linear. So, each and every point deformation point there is a change in the slope. So, actually this plastic modulus is varying during the deformation state, but on the other side if we look into the elastic modulus this is actually constant because stress is proportional to the strain. So, it is linearly varying up to the yield point. So, that is why it remains constant but plastic modulus is gradually varying during the state of the deformation. Of course, there are uh, different way to represent the this mechanical response of the material, but before that we will try to see that each and there are many materials having the strain hardening effect. Strain hardening effect means it means that most of the materials having strain hardening effect and, uh, and that strain hardening effect is that after reaching this further straining level of the stress is gradually increasing with the deformation. So, it means that metal is having the strain hardening effect. Now, the deformation behavior of the stress strain curves can be represented in the following power law also. Of course, there are different ways to represent the stress strain behavior. I just the, the typical behavior or typical uh, mechanical behavior of the materials can be represented in that way. Say, let us start with this thing the linear elastic material. So, some material can behave linearly. So, we can say the linear elastic material. So, in that case we represent stress versus strain is just simply one a linear curve straight line. So, such the stress is proportional to the strain. So, this particular behavior we can say or material we can say that uh, linear elastic material. So, stress equal to uh, E by epsilon. So, I can say the stress by epsilon equal to E. So, that is the the slope remains the constant uh, up to certain limit. So, this is the behavior of the linear elastic material. Similarly, linear elastic plastic behavior. So, linear elastic plastic behavior means if you see this is the from here to here the stress is proportional to the strain or before this point the there is a yielding start at this point. So, yielding start means permanent deformation start, but this permanent deformation can follow is another linear curve. So, here see that this slope the first part elastic part and this we can say the plastic part the slope are different. So, this usually happens suppose in, in, in particular case when there is a sometimes it is very difficult to construct the stress strain curve in the plastic deformation zone. So, for simplicity we can assume that it is a linear even for the plastic deformation zone it is we assume it is a linear curve. So, here you see that both elastic part is there as well as the plastic part is there, but both are linear uh, linear curve here, but at the same time we see there is a slope are different. So, between these two it is a linear elastic means one slope, but it is a linear elastoplastic means basically that there is a some distinguish between the elastic to the plastic uh, zone, uh, some uh, ill stress has to be defined and in these two cases plastic zone and uh, elastic deformation zone the slope are different. So, this is the this way it is different from the first curve. Similarly, material can behave we can say that it is elastic perfectly plastic material. So, it is a material behavior is like that. So, elastic perfectly plastic. So, in that cases we represent the stress strain diagram is like that the, this the slope is changing and uh, sorry constant slope the stress versus strain is uh, changing we can say up to this strain this is the the yield point start and after that it remains the constant. So, it means that uh, elastic and then perfectly plastic in this case there is no strain hardening effect in this particular um, graph. So, that after start yielding it remains uh, the strain uh, stress value remains the constant which is equal to the the, um, the yield, yield point of this particular material. So, that is what we call the perfectly plastic material. Similarly, we can say that this is the another uh, as the rigid and perfectly plastic material rigid perfectly plastic material this particular behavior not having any kind of the elastic de deformation. So, when the further application with the application of the load it starts from the yielding point yield point here even for the zero strain theoretically the starts yielding and then this yield stress remains the constant. So, over this deformation. So, that is why it is called the perfectly plastic and since there is no elastic deformation zone. So, we can say the rigid perfectly plastic deformation or the material behavior is the rigid perfectly plastic. So, this way we represent the stress strain curve or this particular material. Similarly, 
it can be rigid linear hardening so we can say that rigid linear hardening means there is no elastic part but there is a strain hardening effect so here with start from this point yielding is there but it's not constant the it's gradually increasing it gradually increment that it is a strain hardening effect is there so this type of behavior of the material is called as the rigid linear hardening linear hardening the stress the, it is a linear curve that's why we say the linear hardening behavior is basically represented by this particular stress strain diagram or uh, finally you can say that that we can say this is the more convenient to represent because sigma equal to k epsilon to the power which is more widely used that is the power law that means it's a we can say continuously stress uh, uh, there's uh, it's a non-linear non curve and uh, relation between the stress and strain so these are the different ways so material behavior can be replaced different types of the material they behaves different way so with the application of the mechanical load and we can represent all this material behavior in the different way so i have shown you the six different types of the material behavior can be represented but in this case see uh, when we are telling the stress is proportional to the strain this is actually follow the based on the true stress strain uh, value so here you see that uh, sigma true equal to k epsilon to the power and this is the most widely used uh, this power law in the to represent the relation between the stress and strain of course but we consider this is the true stress and true strain now if you take the logarithm of both the side we can say the logarithm of uh, true stress equal to logarithm of k plus n into logarithm of epsilon so here uh, we can see that and this on the logarithm scale it is basically equivalent to the uh, y equal to uh, c plus m into x so it's the in the logarithm scale it becomes is a uh, linear the straight line it represent this thing so here y equal to equivalent to the logarithm of uh, sigma true stress value c is the intercept length m is the slope and x is the variable so x is the logarithm of epsilon so of course the power law is representing but in the logarithm scale it is basically it behaves is the linear way so if we represents the data point over uh, x and y axis but if you convert to the in the logarithm scale if you plot it this should behaves the varying should uh, the stress versus strain behaves uh, the linear way so this we can prove it just to finding out the in logarithm scale it becomes linear so this way we can analyze the different stress and behavior of the different types of the material now when you try to look into the mechanical behavior of this thing we say the different application of the stress and all these things and then there is a uh, in general we try to link the stress in terms of the uh, different uh, material defects associated to, uh, with the deformation process for example in the material forming process we see the deformation process the plastic deformation stage is there so that plastic deformation stage can be explained or can be linked with the dislocations associated with the deformation which is done results in the dislocation movements okay so we know that dislocation is a kind of the defects and when you try to deform the material and even in the plastic deformation there is a generation of the dislocation so this is that means generation of the large amount of the defects and each and every dislocation is also associated with the some amount of the strain energy so basically when you deform it large amount of the dislocation generated basically you are gener converting to the this, this with the applied load in terms of the the strain energy associated with the dislocation and some point of time some amount of the energy if the rate of the deformation are different its the rate of the deformation is very high it is basically converted to the uh, this uh, thermal energy so that is the storage so basically dislocation can be represented in terms of the crystal defects and this uh, increases with the application of the during the plastic deformation stage so before uh, looking into what way the energy is converted this uh, this amount of the energy because of formation of the defects we try to look into what are the different ways the dislocation uh, can be generated so we know there are three types of the dislocation edge screw and the mixed dislocation so edge dislocation uh, is basically uh, can be represented extra half plane of that mean a crystal lattice so for example crystal irregular lattice is there so if we represent there is a extra half is there and that because of that it try to create some kind of the uh, displaced and the in the in the in the lattice so it basically disturb the regular arrangement of the atoms so this way this uh, this because of the extra half plane so this extra half plane is basically representing the 
the edge dislocation. So similar way the screw dislocation can be represent the atom arranged in the helical pattern and that is normal to the direction of the stress. Basically with the application of the stress it, it creates the helical pattern and that is the ideal representation of the screw dislocation and sometimes the dislocation can be mix up of the edge and screw dislocations together. And of course, each and every dislocation is associated with some amount of the, it holds some amount of the strain energy during this process. Now, this plastic deformation or whatever you can say the ill stress all can be explained in terms of the, the in terms of the, this formation of the dislocation and the movement of the dislocation or is there any creation of the obstacles for the movement of the dislocation, it means that it can be represented that there must be some amount of the stress is generated when we, we, we explain in the form of a if there is a dislocation movement is restricted. So, this the from the point of view of the dislocations and their movement we can we can explain the the deformation behavior of the material. But that is the different uh, subject we are not ex exclusively discussing all the different aspect of the dislocations. But we try to get some understanding of the dislocation and it will help to further understanding of the metal deformation process. Now, this is a mechanical behavior of the materials can be better represent the one typical stress strain diagram we have considered and that is the, uh, the uh, these things and we see it is not always the there is a one transition zone maybe sometimes lower yield point and the upper yield point is associated with the deformation behavior of the metal and this is mainly uh, applicable for the low carbon steel. But there is other parameters we can measure one is the, the the plastic deformation or the plasticity of the material can be depends on the ductility or duct, uh, depends on the ductility. So, but what we can define the ductility or it is a basically in terms of the elongation or in terms of the percentage reduction in the area which uh, we can represent this percentage of the elongation or reduction of the area that is a represent of ductility of during the deformation and that is just we look into the stress strain diagram what is the percentage of the uh, this cup that means percentage elongation usually happens to this thing. We get all in the information. Of course, there is another point is that we see the upper yield point, point B. We see the point B upper yield point, they call the yield stress beyond which the yield stress drops to the lower yield point. After that lower yield point is also defined and the stress remains constant up to the point C. We can see up to the this lower yield point, but up to the point C, the stress remains constant. After that, there is a strain hardening effect becomes active. So, of course, this behavior is the it's a, this observation uh, from the stress strain diagram for this particular material, but this behavior can be explained in terms of the formation of the crystal defects, then specifically dislocation formation of the dislocation and their movement of the dislocations, both can be utilized to explain all this phenomena. But here we see that the stretch BC is called the uh, BC uh, is called the uh, plastic yield or the plastic flow between B and C. So, I can say the between the lower and upper yield point value plastic yield point and after that the yielding of the steel is accompanied by formation of the so called Luders lines which have an angle about 45 to the axis of the uh, test a sample. The yielding can also be still can also be the explained in terms of the uh, this thing uh, Luders line. It means that angle with the axis of the test sample. So, suppose this is the axis of the test sample. So, uh, around 45 degree angle. So, what is the deformation happens on this shear plane? So, this is the this is can be uh, represent the so called the Luders line. So, we can explain the 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 yielding basically yielding occurs uh, gradually with the deformation. Now, the curve C D is we can say the indicate the stress increases with increasing the strain we can see that is the from C to D stress increases with increase, increasing the strain. But here the with the nonlinear behavior and this phenomenon is called the work hardening or strain hardening. So, this is because C D increasing C it is to C to D this is called the work hardening strain hardening and reaches some optimum point. But this maximum engineering stress at point which is known as the uh, this ultimate uh, tensile strength and then up this is strain hardening and after that it necking starts from this point D. The gradually reduction of the cross section area and the stress also gradually reduce, reduces because necking as cross section area is basically uh, reduces in this particular necking starts and after that it becomes fractured. So, from this point to this point we can say necking happens or I can the it is called the strain softening behavior is also associated and finally it reaches to the uh, fracture point. So, this stress softening, strain hardening, yielding and all can be explained in terms of the movement of the 
dislocation and in a in a material now now here the deformation behavior during the unloading unloading differs from the behavior of the loading due to the bow singer effect it means that here we have shown the diagram the, it is a straining that we are applying the uh, tensile testing so tensile loading are applying this thing we reach the yielding point all these things but of course uh, after reaching the yield point uh, uh, in the tensile testing again if you perform the compressive testing also so compressive testing the yield point the yielding will occur one particular uh, point so even for the with the application of the compressive load and the tensile load the yield point can be different so this type of the behavior is known as the uh, boxinger effect so it means that yield point in tensile and yield point in the compressive load are different so we see that Bowsinger effect is a phenomena, uh, okay, increase plastic deformation of the metal that actually results in the increase of the yield strength in the direction of the plastic flow, but decrease in the yield strength in the opposite direction. It means that the yield point in the tensile loading is much more as compared to the, the compressive loading. So this effect is basically known as the Bowsinger effect. Therefore, ductility, we already mentioned the ductility is one of the measure. Uh, to understand or to link directly with the metal deformation or material forming operation. So therefore, we need to know the ductility is associated with the uh, different uh, deformation process. So here from the stress strain diagram, we can see the percentage elongation, percentage change in the cross section area, we can see that percentage elongation is the final length minus initial length divided by the initial length into 100 that actually increase the percentage of the elongation. Similarly, percentage reduction in the cross section area is that initial cross section area minus final because here in final initial cross section area more than final cross section area because necking happens some point of time during the deformation stage. So therefore, cross section area reduces. So that is why we make it A0 minus AF divided by A0 into 100 that actually indicates the percentage reduction in the cross section area. So basically this way we can measure the ductility uh, behavior or ductility uh, available for this particular material. Now once we calculate the basics of the from the deformation of the uh, one component and the, we can characterize the uh, different mechanical properties we can define associated with the uh, stress strain diagram of a particular material. Similarly, the formability is also important because all we are doing analysis try to link in the formability of this thing of a material. So formability means how is we can deform the material uh, in, in this case the ability of the material to deform one and that is the uh, reach to a very specific shape and size. At the same time reasonably low force, low power and the cost involvement cost also low. So that is we can define the, the formability of the uh, of a material. So basically we are trying to look into the different point of view to understand the formality that means how easily we can deform the material and what is the uh, can we apply during the deformation is the very low amount of the force we achieve this deformation or power consumption is low for this particular deformation process or even cost is also low uh, uh, during this process. So all is the factors to understand the formability of a particular material. Now this property of the material it is the even formality can be uh, seen in other way also property of the material that enables us to manufacture complex part. We can manufacture complex part just following the deformation and of course the deformation means we, we, we can deform in such a that we the it reach the die cavity uh, then to for a uh, to capture the intricate details of the uh, particular component when you try to deform the material and with the complex part can be possible and uh, with the utmost accuracy with the accuracy that means is a what is the complexity of the component we can manufacture using this uh, material that actually indicates the formability of the particular material. The formality of the material also depends on the what is the yield strength and ductility of this material. That means what is the ductility property, it is a can it absorb the large deformation of the material or what is the yield strength of this particular material. So is the low yield strength means we can easily deform the material and at the high yield strength means there is a uh, we cannot easily deform the material. So based on that how is we can easily deform that actually decided by the yield strength of this particular material and this is a measure of the formability of a uh, of a particular component. Even we can see the formality can be looked into in the point of view that higher the ductility that means the ductility means a wide range of the deformation range is there and the lower will be the yield strength. So 
high amount of the ductility, low amount of the yield strength is means that material is having better formability. So, this is the way to represent the formability. Similarly, it has been experimentally proved that formability of the material improves with increasing temperature. We see that the mechanical property, the yield strength, hardness all can, can be reduced. So, it decreases at the elevated temperature. So, strength of a material, it will be difficult to the or I can say that much amount of the strength is required to deform the room temperature. But the same component, if we heat it of a certain temperature and then we try to deform, we, we need less amount of the load because the heated component, the yield strength or other mechanical properties actually strength actually reduces. So, therefore, so this formability of a material is the can be improved if we perform the deformation action not room temperature rather we perform at the very high temperature then it is more easy to deform the material. So, that is why we say the temperature is another factor to decide the formability of the component. Now, we try to look into that what is the mechanical behavior of the plastic. So, we have already discussed the mechanical behavior of the, the metallic material that how it is different when you try to handle the plastics or polymers. So, mechanical properties of the polymers are actually specified with many of the same parameters of course, same parameters that means the what the mechanical parameters are different stress, strain, yield point all this similar way we can define for the polymeric material are used and but uh, for example, this modulus of elasticity, uh, yield strain, tensile strain all this similar kind of the terminology similar concept or uh, similar analogy we can apply for the polymeric material. Similarly, the mechanical characteristics of polymer is basically highly sensitive to the rate of deformation that is strain rate, temperature and the chemical nature of the environment that means in presence of the some water, in presence of the oxygen, in presence of the organic solvent or actually greatly influence the mechanical behavior of the polymeric material. So, therefore, here you can see that when you are talking about the deformation of the material but of course, when the deformation, but what is the rate of the deformation? So, which is defined by the strain rate. So, I mean to say that in the polymeric material, the strain rate is the very much sensitive. So, it is a very important parameter uh, during the deformation, but apart from strain rate, that it, it is very much sensitive to the temperature because at high temperature, the polymer very quickly, the uh, drops is uh, the properties, the uh, all kind of the mechanical properties. So, therefore, it is very much sensitive to the temperature and of course, it is very much sensitive to the environment. So, I am talking this particular, this is the strain rate, very highly sensitive uh, parameter for polymer is the strain rate, temperature and the environment. But this, uh, this the sensitivity is much more in case of the polymer, but with respect to the uh, metallic material because metallic material is also sensitive to the strain rate, temperature and the chemical nature of the environment, but not like the polymeric material. So, here is the difference uh, in the in terms of the mechanical behavior for the metallic material and mechanical behavior for the polymeric material. Now, most of the thermoplastics which is called them uh, in the in the molten state or even for the solid state, they actually exhibits a non-Newtonian and viscoelastic behavior. So, non-Newtonian means is a Newtonian uh, flow of, of the material. So, in the molten state, uh, it is not basically Newtonian uh, fluid do not behave like a non Newtonian fluid, but rather we can say the thermoplastic in the molten state behaves like a non Newtonian fluid. And of course, during the solid phase, it is not exactly the elastic and the perfectly plastic, rather for polymer, mostly it behaves like a viscoelastic behavior. So, visco means the viscosity and the elastic properties, maybe combining these two, we can represent the viscoelastic behavior is the is the more characteristic feature of the polymeric material with the application of the mechanical loading or during the deformation stage of the polymer. Now, of course, uh, we already said that the stress and strain not linearly related to the most of the first of the stress strain curve. We can see that in the in the metallic part, this initial part is the elastic part and then it, it is usually goes to the uh, plastic deformation which is non-linear, but elastic part is actually linear, but that kind of the behavior may not be present in case of the polymer because here the stress and strain relation is mostly non-linear uh, in this thing and in the stress strain curve. We can see that typical stress strain curve also to understand what it behaves and how it is different from the metallic component. Similarly, the mechanical behavior is closely tied with the manner in which the polymer chains move 
what if we try to look into the mechanism here the polymer change moves related to one another with the application of the load to the polymeric material. So, therefore, in this case the deformation depends on the uh, at the same time one is the time and second is the the rate of loading the rate of applications uh, uh, rate of applied load uh, depends on both the factors time and the applied load rate of applied load is a factor that in this case the mechanical behavior is more closely explained in terms of these two parameters. And of course, we already changed mentioned that the is a very much sensitive polymer is very sensitive to the temperature and it is basically the temperature, but at the, the ch changes near the room temperature that means the polymer is existing very small change in the above the room temperature. This is the properties drastically changes in case of the polymer. But uh, I mean to say we cannot compare in the in the with respect to metal because in metal say for example, steel what is the deformation be where the room temperature and deformation be where 1000 degree centigrade. There is a huge differences, but we can get some mechanical properties, mechanical strength available even for the 1000 degree centigrade. But polymeric material mostly it cannot go like 1000 degree, the cannot retain their properties even 1000 degree centigrade because basically the melting temperature is very low in case of the polymer as compared to the metallic material. So, the deformation the if you say that temperature sensitivity, but that temperature sensitivity go very close to the room temperature. So, just mean it is a very less temperature maybe maybe uh, if assume the room temperature is 30 degree the properties can drastically deteriorate even 35 or the 40 degree centigrade in case of the polymer. So, that temperature range is the very very low in case of the polymer as compared to the metallic component. So, here you can try to understand that the mechanical behavior of the what we can construct the stress strain diagram of the metallic material, but polymeric metal we say represent the diagram in terms of the strain and the time. So, x axis the time and uh, y axis either apply stress or, uh, or we can represent in terms of the strain. So, here you can understand the stress strain curve is really linear for polymer. So, never uh, I think really linear for polymer mostly it is having the non-linear between the stress versus strain. The deformation is affected by the strain rate and temperature is the most important. So, of course, we have to be it is a very much sensitive to the strain rate and temperature. So, therefore, we mention it uh, which is completely different from the metallic material. Now, the mechanical deformation of the polymer is a combination of the elastic solid and the highly viscous combining this viscous and elastic solid. And these two combining these two we can represent is the, the term as the viscoelastic property uh, or we can define the viscoelast uh, yes viscoelastic properties of the polymeric material. Now, if you look into the deformation behavior of the polymer it is having basically three elements one is the reversible elastic deformation we can see that reversible this part is the reversible elastic deformation over the time. So, that means this amount of the uh, uh, elastic recovery is possible then but other time dependent viscoelastic deformation we can see the viscoelastic deformation this part and this part it is basically time dependent viscoelastic deformation and then we can see the time dependent plastic deformation. So, only plastic deformation consists of this this part is a time dependent uh, plastic deformation. So, actually we see with the application of the uh, load. So, it deformation starts from here it is go to this way and then reduces and then it becomes this way. This is the typical behavior of the, the strain versus time, but if you look into the applied stress, applied stress is something like that the stress and then with respect to time is this one. So, we apply this thing uh, amount of the load, but it behaves uh, like this with respect to time. So, this is the amount of the load is applied, but the with respect to the strain versus time the strain is basically increasing then gradually decreasing and it leads to the some uh, lower values of the strain component with respect to time. So, these are the typical behavior of the stress strain uh, with respect to time associated with the polymeric uh, material. Here we can get some understanding that how the stress versus strain looks like. So, in different types of the polymeric material. So, PMMA, PS6, ABS, PP, HDPE, LDPE all are the different types of the polymer. We see that how this thing uh, PMMA the elastic strain, comp strain part is very very low and if you see HDPE the strain component is very high. So, it is the over a wide range uh, that means a long range this can deform and of course, other part we can see that the very small small 
uh, this thing the deformation is very small in the different part of this component. So, this way we represent that how the all the stress strain curve is not I think no where you can find out the very linear component is there all are non-linear behavior associated with the polymeric component which is completely different from the, the metallic material. Now, here you see that uh, elastic modulus uh, with respect to temperature also that means the how polymer behavior changes with reference to the temperature. We see that uh, elastic modulus is, is very high at room temperature, but when it is reached to the glass transition temperature Tg, uh, this becomes a glassy state the Tg temperature and then it is reached to the melting point temperature the elastic modulus is close to 0 once it reaches the melting point temperature. So, these are the different stage. So, glassy elastic the glassy stage, leathery stage, rubbery flow and the it is counting the viscous flow. So, that means the is the viscous flow means it is the elastic elastic modulus is gradually reducing and the in the glassy stage the viscous mod, elastic modulus is much higher but the leathery state the elastic modulus is low and when it is reached to the viscous flow then the elastic modulus is very 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 low. So, viscous point because you know the viscosity is the property of the usually the liquid. So, that is why when it is basically the steepness will be 0 when it is converted to the uh, liquid phase. So, that is why in the viscous flow part this elastic steepness part elastic modulus part is basically very low in, in this particular ok. So, this way we can transition of the material, but see the transition temperature glass transition temperature becomes soft, but exactly then it reach to the melting point temperature. So, like metal we can directly start from solid to uh, this just release of the latent it solid it change the phase from solid to the liquid phase, but in this case there is a with the application of the temperature for polymer it will reach to the first glass transition temperature and then after that further heating it reach to the melting point temperature. So, here see that elastic modulus temperature, but uh, is the crystalline polymer the behavior is different on the cross link polymer and the amorphous polymer. So, we see the crystalline polymer and amorphous polymer this, this curve elastic modulus curve are completely different uh, with respect to the temperature even crystalline polymer even it retain some amount of the uh, elastic modulus or steepness even the temperature is also very high. But amorphous polymer see the it very quickly lose the, the steepness value with the increment, increment of the temperature. So, that is why one cases uh, this crystalline polymer and the amorphous polymer and uh, other cases the, the cross link polymer cross link polymer means is basically thermo settings polymer and uh, thermoplastic polymer. So, thermo setting and thermoplastic polymer this steepness with respect to temperature is completely uh, different. So, this the typical behavior of the uh, plastic component uh, the we can analyze the both in terms of the, the mechanical strength and what are the mechanical strength will reduces we can see with the increment of the temperature and sensitivity of the temperature in terms of the elastic modulus we can we can see here from these figures. Now, once you understand the mechanical behavior of the polymeric material and the plastic material, then we try to discuss about the, the overall this different metal forming operation. We are talking about this is the bulk deformation process or I can say the deformation process or I can say the solid processes with the processing that uh, this materials processing, but in this material processing in easily perform at the, in the solid state. So, that is why the solid state material processing the uh, term here utilizing the uh, metal forming operation or metal forming processes. So, metal forming processes we have two basic category one is the based on the working temperature and based on the operation temperature operation type type of operation. So, based on the working temperature we can see it is a cold working process we can say hot working process and between this we can say that it is a warm working process. So, it is a basically the temperature can define whether it is hot working the cold working or whether it is warm working process. Similarly, based on the operation type we have the the one is the bulk met metal forming. So, bulk metal forming is the big usually the thickness is very high. So, big structure uh, or dimension is re relatively much more I can say that in terms of the thickness is very I can say the bulk metal forming operation. And the similarly when it is the very sheet thickness we are using and uh, for the different bend, uh, different forming operation then it is called the sheet metal forming operation. But in between we can say the sheet bulk metal forming operation. So, it is just transition between the bulk forming and the sheet metal forming in between. 
So, bulk metal forming having different processes, techniques of the which, which is the roll, rolling process. So, to process the bulk metal or I can say the bulk metal deformation process, the procedure is on the rolling operation can be done one is the forging operation, extrusion we can use the wear or bar drawing operation. Similarly, sheet metal forming operation with the which basically handle the type of the material is the very in the form of a very thin sheet. So, the thin sheet can be shearing, thin sheet can be blanking, piercing, bending, deep drawing, stretching all this operation forming operation associated with the sheet metal forming operations. And between these two is the sheet bulk metal forming operation, this is the coining and ironing, these two are known as the uh, sheet bulk metal forming operation. So, these are the typical processes associated with the uh, metal forming operations or metal forming processes. Now, here we can I can define this uh, individual terminology that uh, we use the bulk metal deformation process. One is the bulk metal forming operation. So, bulk metal forming operation the refer to those metal forming operation that involve significant change in the thickness of the cross section area of the workpiece. So, that means the significant change is the large amount of the changes in the after the deformation usually happens. So, that we can measure in terms of the, the thickness or there is a uh, cross section what is the amount of the cross section area changes or what is the amount of the thickness changes and if it is very high then we can say it is the bulk metal forming operations. So, this bulk metal forming operation techniques are the rolling operation, forging operation, extrusion and drawing and there are other processes also has been developed to perform the bulk metal forming operations. Apart from this thing there is a sheet metal forming operation. So, sheet metal forming operation refers to the metal form that involves no or little change in the thickness. So, very small thickness change in the thickness is associated with the sheet metal forming operations or cross very small cross section area changes is associated with this, this process. A example is the shearing operation, blanking, piercing, bending, deep drawing stretching all are associated with the sheet metal forming operations. Similarly, sheet metal bulk forming uh, which is a process involved forming of the metal sheet with an intended three dimensional material flow as in the bulk forming operation. So, we can three dimensional state of it means that uh, if you see uh, when you look into the uh, the sheet metal forming operation we can represent the process usually in the two dimensional because one dimensional part we can neglect because we are handling the sheet metal. Similarly, in, when it is the bulk metal deformation the flow behavior or other behavior is always associated with the three dimensional states. So, stress, loading action all can be associated with the three dimension, but uh, if you look into this thing of course, the flow behavior we can consider, but analysis the deformation behavior in such a way it can not neglecting on the third dimension the deformation or any other operations, but when you consider the third dimension of also, but not up to that extent what we observe in case of the bulk metal forming operation. So, therefore, that is why in the sheet metal bulk operation it is the intended three dimensional metal flow we can observe, but as in the bulk processes, but not that extent in the third dimension what we can get in case of the bulk metal forming operation. Now, when you are talking about the material forming operation, it is always associated with the recrystallization because it is associated with the metal forming operation. So, recrystallization is nothing but the refinement of the grain. If you remember, I am discussing about when you plastically deform the material, it is basically associated with the large amount of the crystal defects in the form of dislocation is generated within the structure itself and each and having some amount of the energy stored in the form of a strain energy associated with the each and every dislocation. Now, if the certain uh, conditions met, so then what happens in this case is the stored energy can be or when it is cross some amount of the critical barrier or critical amount of the energy then within the solid phase itself the nucleation starts and the nucleation when nucleation start it creates the new grain, new strain free grain it is it is creating. So, when the formation of the new strain free grains as compared to the consumption of the old deformed grains, this process, this transition process is known as the recrystallization. Of course, it is always associated with the metal forming operation is a, a large extent. So, that is why uh, if you remember the some amount of the energy stored in the form of a uh, deformation energy stored energy in the form of formation of the crystal defect, but some amount in, in this cases. So, some um, amount of the mechanical energy is actually converted to the thermal energy. So, that is why this recrystallization is associated with the strain 
strain rate and temperature. So, there are different types of the recrystallization we will discuss, but in general we can say the recrystallization occurs, it is a must be a function of the temperature, strain rate and strain. So, in that way the forming operation is associated with the recrystallization temperature. So, it is basically the which is the uh, temperature at which the atomic mobility is effective enough to reorient or realign the grains basically. So, realign either reorient that means some recovery is there or it can create the new grain strain free grains. So, this actually uh, this temperature that temperature is known as the recrystallization temperature. Similarly, hot working temperature means some metal forming operation is performed at the high temperature because it makes easy to deform the material or basically I said the strength of the material is actually decreases with increasing the temperature. So, take that advantage of that thing. So, we can perform the forming operation at relatively high temperature. So, that is why it is a hot working which is temperature above the recrystallization temperature, decreases temperature we can consider this as a reference temperature, but with if it is above the recrystallization temperature, if the deformation is performed then it is known as the hot working process. Similarly, warm working is the working of the metal forming or done at temperature which is around 30 to 50 percent of the melting point temperature of the material. This is known as the warm forming operation, but cold, cold working or cold forming is basically associated with the metal forming operation which is usually done. Glow at, at usually in the room temperature, or other we can say that in terms of the, the recrystallization temperature, we can say if the, the deformation operation is performed below the point uh, 30 percent of the melting point temperature, then it is known as the, the cold working or cold forming operation. So, these are the all different terminology associated with the metal forming operation. So, we will try to discuss later on that uh, about how to utilize all this, this terminology will help to understand the different uh, explanation of different technology associated with the material processing, bulk material processing or seed material processing which is associated with the, uh, that the solid processes. It means that there is no melting happens during the solid deformation process. I think that is all. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you.